Hey, welcome. We are in a series called The Nine Things That Matter, and we are learning and studying through the books that, or the letters that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to Timothy while he was a young pastor in the city called Ephesus. And last week we started that series uh, with the first thing that mattered, which was leaving a legacy. Leaving a spiritual legacy was a whole idea last week, that, that, uh, that Paul was leaving a legacy to Timothy, and Timothy was leaving a legacy to the church, and on and on it went in, in building a spiritual legacy. And, uh, and so that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're digging into the next nine, next one of the nine things that matter uh, this morning. But before we do that, I want, to, I want to have somebody come up and help me out here. Is uh, Lawrence in the house? Hey, Lawrence. Let's give Lawrence a hand, everybody. It's, it's great when uh, somebody gets voluntold to do something and they do it. So, um, so do you like donuts, Lawrence? Yeah. I like donuts. You like donuts? Okay, yeah. how many of you love donuts? Like, you'd enjoy donuts, right? Now, this morning, did we sell out of donuts out there in the cafe? There were just a lot of donuts, I think, that, that went because on, like, cold days, a hot drink and a nice donut just tastes really good. So I, I grabbed you a donut, oh, uh, and you can, you can eat it. Um, and uh, do you like powder, sh- sugar donuts? Okay, they can be yeah. messy. What is, what's some of your favorite donuts? Just shout it out right now. What is your favorite donut? Somebody say strawberry any. I like that answer. Like, just give me a donut glaze. Maybe like cream sticks. Like, okay, like cream sticks, that's, that's a drug. That's, that's just something wrong with that, right? Like, <laughs> like the sugar in there just, woo, you know, really gets to you. Um, now, what if I told you, though, uh, Lawrence, that you're, you're really going down uh, with that donut. Um, what if I told you that I just sprinkled a little bit of rat poison on that? Um. That's not okay. That's not a, a problem? Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. Um, sorry. Um, so, so we'll see how he feels later as he leaves the gathering um, to run to the bathroom. Uh, no, but like, I didn't for real. But like, okay. it's a what if, it's a what if I did kind of a thing. Because like, if, if I did that, and maybe if it was just a little bit, like he probably wouldn't even notice that it was there and he might eat the donut. And by the end, something might not be right, but he'd be like, okay, that was weird. Um, but if I gave him a donut every day and put a little bit more rat poison in it every single day, there would be this toxicity that would build up. That wouldn't be good, would it? No. That no. no. Um, and that toxicity, as it builds up, would make him feel more and more sick the more he ate those donuts over time. It wouldn't be good. Now, some of you I know have allergies to certain foods. Like, you maybe can't have a little bit of it, but if you keep having it, it's going to build up in your system, and it's, it's going to be like poison inside of you. Um, see, this, I'm, I'm talking about donuts, and, and, um, and the thing is with donuts, we're going to call this the spiritual donut, okay? Because Paul is talking to Timothy kind of about the same idea, that, that, that he was writing to Timothy because in the church, there was a group of people that were poisoning the truth, little by little, that were taking people they thought sounded right, it, like, it tasted like a good spiritual donut, but it was just a hair off, or, or sometimes it was way off, but they were attracting people away from the real thing, the real donut. Now, you can take that with you, and, right. and, uh, and you can wash it down with some hot chocolate. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Just give Lawrence a hand. Um, that would be bad, wouldn't it, if it actually did have rat poison on it? It would be really bad. It would be mean and cruel. We didn't do it, just so you know. Nobody write in and say, why did you kill that young man? Um, so, so this whole idea of that spiritual donut— that's what Paul was saying to Timothy. Timothy, there are some people in the church that are poisoning the gospel. They're, they're putting a small amount of something that isn't the gospel, and they're pulling people away from the truth. And, and that's the warning. That's, that's a huge warning, right? Actually, some of these people we saw were listed in our passage last week um, that we started, because last week as we talked about leaving a legacy, Paul's letter to Timothy in, the, in Ephesus, he was talking to Timothy, and he was talking about a couple of people that this, this is what they did. Um, so 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting verse 19 here, he says, holding on to the faith, he's encouraging Timothy, hold on to the faith with a good conscience, which some have rejected, and so have, been, have suffered shipwreck, with regard to the faith, meaning they had a faith, they, they heard the gospel, and they liked it, but they started going off. The, they, they started moving in a direction that was heading them towards the rocks, <laughs> and where they were going to be shipwrecked, because no longer were they in line with the truth. And he says, they've suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander. And the last week I said, wouldn't it be great to have your name in the Bible? <laughs> 
for the good things, right? But these guys got in there for the bad things. Like, they're permanently in the record, you know? Like, don't be like these guys because they shipwrecked their faith not in a good way, right? They, they, they shipwrecked and they didn't, um, they were handed over, actually, is what Paul says in the next verse, in that next part of the verse. And I handed them over to Satan so they may learn not to blaspheme. Wow, talk about some spiritual authority. Like, Paul's like, and Paul had it. Paul had spiritual authority in the church. Paul had spiritual and he had positional authority over Timothy as a young pastor. And Paul is saying, this is what they've done, and we've handed them over to Satan so that they might learn about their shipwreck, right? They may understand about that. That's dangerous. And my warning last week is don't get shipwrecked, right? That was my warning last week, because we can be shipwrecked in different ways. We can be spiritually shipwrecked in our faith by our own choices or sin, sin desires or lifestyle and behaviors, like the things that we do, we can choose, boom, we're hopping on the boat to shipwreck. Or it can happen, and what we're talking about today is when we hop on a ship that is doctrinally wrong. Like it's, it's not... It's not in the foundation, the essentials of the gospel. It's heading down a different path. And we can start to believe things that aren't true at all about God, about his word, about how he works. And we can then end up being shipwrecked in our faith because we were off, because we were off. And so I want to protect you. I want to protect our church body. Don't get shipwrecked. Don't even get on that ship, right? Um, so this morning, I'm really talking about not necessarily our own decisions that shipwreck us because I think all of us can... Um, we probably know what those are, you know? <laughs> like, all of us know those things that we do or we've done or those paths we've gone down. And some, some of you are maybe on that path. You, you've headed towards shipwreck, and maybe you're trying to come back to God. You're trying to get things right, and that's awesome. The great news last week was that God has a lifeboat. His name is Jesus. He says, jump off the shipwreck and get in the lifeboat, and he'll take you back because he loves you, right? That's the good news of the gospel. That's what he does for you. But this one that we're talking about this morning is about the shipwreck of false doctrine. So, so the thing this morning that I want to talk about between false beliefs and doctrines, this is the thing, all right? One of the nine things that matter is this. You can write this down. Nine things that matter. This one is sound biblical teaching. It matters. Sound biblical teaching matters. It mattered to Paul, right? The apostle. It mattered to Paul in this this church in Ephesus, and if you weren't here last week, I described the city of Ephesus. You can go back and watch the message last week. Um, but it was a difficult culture. There was a lot of stuff going on in that culture that really mimics what happens in the United States, to be honest with you. It's very similar. So as Paul was writing to Timothy, saying, you better be careful. Be sound in your teaching, right? Like, be sure that you know what you're preaching, Timothy, and, and don't be like Alexander and Hymenaeus and all these other guys that shipwreck your faith. Like, stay solid. Sound biblical teaching matters. Spiritual authority and leadership matters. Now, I'm going to describe that a little bit better because some of you, the moment I say authority, you're going like, Argh. you know, authority sounds like, like prison, like you're getting chained to something, like, hey, lead me. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? Biblical authority, scriptural authority, spiritual authority is a whole nother thing. Jesus had it, and Jesus did not lead as a dictator. He led as a humble servant, didn't he? That's spiritual authority. He's earned it and proved it by his humility, his actions, and his love. That's the kind of thing we're talking about with this whole idea of biblical teaching with spiritual authority in people's lives. I want you, all of us in this room, by the time we leave today, to be able to have the tools to discern between false and true doctrine, okay? I'm going to give you a lot, and I'm going to shoot it at you fast. So, um, so let's hop into the scriptures together. So if you have your Bible, I would say bring them, right? Now, last, the last gathering, I didn't have my slides up on the TV, and I just had to preach it just for my notes, and they had to pay attention because I didn't have up here. Now, I'm, I, I have them up here now, this gathering, but that means you still have to get in your own Bibles, and you still have to pay attention, all right? Is everybody ready? All right, 1 Timothy is in, your, is in the New Testament, kind of towards the end, you know, of the New Testament, some of those smaller books of the Bible. And, um, and this is Paul, again, writing to Timothy in chapter 1. And, uh, and we're going to be reading about this part, this whole idea of doctrine. So starting in verse 3, if you're with me, say, yep. yep. All right, he says this. He says, I urged you to Timothy. I urged you when I uh, went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. That's a pretty powerful word, isn't it? Like, <laughs> Paul's like, I, I left you, Timothy, so you can command them. Like, he's saying, you have spiritual and positional authority over these people. So you need to command them to not be teaching false doctrines. That's your role, Timothy. 
man, Timothy was a young guy, young pastor, jumping right in to the deep end, really. He says, so, so, so tell them not to do this or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. It's like, tell them not to, to get sucked into things that don't really matter. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. He says, such things like that promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command, again, there's the word command. The goal of it is what? Is love. See, spiritual authority has a different component. It's called love. Positional authority has a different, a different word, and it's more like, uh, you know, like control, right? And sometimes there are people in Scripture and people in your life that have both, spiritual and positional authority, meaning they're going to lead you in love, but they may have a command for you to grow, Right? That's what he's saying. Timothy, the command of this is love, which comes from what? A pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. He's commending Timothy. He's like, you have these things in your life. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. It's one of my favorite verses. Because he's like, and they don't even know what they're talking about, right? Have you ever wanted to say that about somebody? <laughs> like, like, their lips are moving, but they are not that smart. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're, they're a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Like, what are they even talking about? But they're confident, and they're just bringing it, you know? Like, like come on, you know? That, that's, that's I, I, I'm getting a little creative there. But I think that's what he's saying. He's like, these people are so confident in what they're saying, what they're speaking, but they're way off in what they're preaching, what they're speaking. And, and this is where Paul's giving Timothy authority. Watch the red lights, the warning lights, the burr, burr, burr. That's what he's saying. Timothy, you have the authority to protect the church from these individuals, like Alexander and the other guy. I always forget how to pronounce his name. Okay? So, so when we think about a couple of these words, one, I've already talked about the word command, positional authority and spiritual authority. But the other thing that he talks about is these men are going down this journey of myths and genealogies and creating these controversial you know, arguments with other people. And uh, I had to dig a little deeper into that, and some believe that that, that is really talking about the, the Jews that accepted Christ. They got saved, but they were still attached to their old Jewish roots and uh, the religion and all the background. And so, so they, would can, they would go back and look at all these old genealogies some of them to prove their lineage, you know, kind of their, their prestige in the Jewish faith. That, that, that said, so, well, my father, my grandfather's father, and da, 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 and I go back to Moses, and whatever, you know, like they, they would want to prove kind of who they were and what, why they mattered, and so they would argue about these things and who was more important, and, and sometimes they, they would talk about these stories throughout these genealogies that, that's, uh, that they believed were more myth-like. I don't know if you've ever heard stories of, like, your family that was generations ago, and how they can kind of get bigger and bigger. You know, the stories can kind of get glamorized, and you can make them say more than what they actually did and what happened in that time. And I think that's what he was talking about when he's saying these myths. It's like they're creating these things in these scenarios, and they're bringing them up out of these small little things, and they're making them a big deal to their faith. And they're forgetting about the big thing, which is the gospel, in the midst of what they're presenting and talking to and creating quarrels and arguments amongst the other people. It's like, these guys are not doing God's work. This is controversial. Now, it, we're, we're going to read in a minute, there's, there's a whole other level because then there are those that were adding to the gospel, meaning they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were being even more um, difficult in what they were creating in the church in Ephesus. So we're going to go a few chapters ahead, okay? So turn a few pages. We're going to be in chapter 6 now because it's all through First and Second Timothy, this whole idea of Paul trying to encourage Timothy um, so, so fast forward to chapter 6 We're going to start in the second half of verse 2 um, For those of you that, that uh, have your Bibles open Whenever you see something like this, a reference that's, that's like saying that's the address That's where it is in the Bible, right? So you can find it, you can go search And I would encourage you afterwards Go search these verses out And read them for yourself Not just like take Tim's word for it And I'll explain why in just a little bit, okay? So when it says something like 6 2 b it doesn't mean like to be or not to be. Like it, what it means is that's the second half of that verse, okay? So we're starting in the second half. Um, some of you laughed and some of you just don't care about my jokes. <laughs> it hurt my feelings. All right, so here we go. Verse 2. 
the second half. He says, these are the things you are to teach and insist on. He's talking to Timothy. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. Now it sounds like Paul's about to hit below the belt with these guys. Like he's just kind of saying that as it is. These people are conceited and they actually understand nothing. He says they have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Do you hear, do you hear who he's describing? Right? He's, like, he's teaching Timothy, just look out for these things, right? Because when you find them, you're going to find a false teacher. When you find them, you're going to find a false doctrine. And when you find them, deal with them, is what he's saying to Timothy. Like, command them. Don't teach this stuff. Why are you trying to create quarrels and frustrations and all this kind of stuff in the church? Now, I, I let you guys know this, and I say this quite often because it's true. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? Like, like people are people, sinners are sinners. We have been from then in Ephesus to today. Nothing has changed in the church. There are people who, just like he's talking about here, want to bring up small, minute words to bring up great controversies to make themselves look good and win people over in an argument. And they're actually hindering the gospel work, not helping it. There's dangers here. There's really great dangers here. And so I want to teach us in this room how, like Paul was teaching Timothy, how can we discern? How can we discern whether what we are hearing is truth, meaning the balloon is red, right? The donut is a spiritual donut. There's no, there's no rat poison on it. Like, how can we be sure that we know that it is true and right compared to something that is false and off? How can we know for sure? Because you will be putting yourself, as you grow in your Christian walk, you will be putting yourself under spiritual leaders. You'll be putting yourself under spiritual influences. There'll be people you allow to listen to, you allow yourself to listen to, and, um, and you have to be so careful. So careful. Because some of the sweetest, smooth-talking people are leading people far away from the gospel. And it's dangerous. It is so, so dangerous. So, I, I want to teach us, and you can fill in the blank on this one. As we think about this, I want us to discern between true and false teaching. Go ahead and write that down. I want to give you the tools today. Very practical tools. You're going you're gonna to go away with a lot today. Very practical tools to discern between true and false teaching. Now, let me, before we get, really get into it, let me um, define some terms, okay? Because there's a difference between somebody who might preach an error and somebody who preaches a heresy, okay? There's, there's very different things, okay? Um, let me describe what it means to, like, preach in error. Like, when you think of error, it's, it means a mistake has been made, right? Um, and, and when you think about pastors and preachers and, and people that God puts in front of people to, to speak the Word of God, um, I think about my journey, and I'm like, go back, and I wish I had a way back machine to say, Tim, 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 right? Like, don't say that. Don't, don't preach that. What is, you, because there are things that you will preach and teach based upon what you know in that season of your life, right? And it's interesting, as you grow, God continues to hone in those things in your life, and he continues to give you experiences to understand that truth in a new way. The reality is God's truth never changes, but we grow deeper and more into it as we grow and mature. Does that make sense? So there are times you'll have a preacher that preaches something, and you're like, that sounded close, but not quite. Like, they didn't quite get that right when they kind of went through that passage, but I understood what they were trying to say over here. That's, that could be called preaching in error, meaning they're, they're saying something maybe out of ignorance, but it's not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's not blasphemy against the Word of God. It's not blasphemy and heresy to the gospel, right? It's just they didn't get that fact right about so-and-so, or they didn't quite understand the full context of that one verse. That is, that is preaching in error, and that's okay. That happens. Why? Humans, right? <laughs> like... <laughs> We're all human beings. That's where we show grace to one another. Isn't that the good thing about grace with one another? So that's preaching in error. We can show grace to people. And those who are farther along than that person can come and say, okay, let me help you understand that a little bit better. And welcome back to mentoring, which is what we talked about last week. That the Young preachers, young pastors, young teachers need that in their life 
so they can continue to continue to grow. If they respond with humility, they're showing godly character, right? They're being teachable, like, I didn't even realize it. I didn't mean to say it that way. Now, heresy, on the other side, is quite different, because heresy is, I'm going to add something to the gospel. I believe you can be saved by, by Jesus and doing a lot of good things. So you better be sure you do all the good things to keep your Jesus um, so that you can make and earn your way to heaven. That's blasphemy. That's heresy. That's not the gospel. That's the gospel plus whatever they wanted to add to it, okay? So now they're preaching outside of the context of truth. And typically what I see a lot of the times is people that add things to the gospel are usually trying to get things for themselves. There's usually a selfish motivation or a pride in that individual as they're bringing the word of God, right? Like they're, they're doing it from a wrong heart of motive and they're not going to be teachable to, to teach any differently. I have the word, this is my word, and this is what I'm preaching. Do you hear the difference? You can be humble and in an error, but be teachable, but you can be over here in heresy, add to the gospel, or change the word of God to make it say what you want it to, and you're out of alignment. So I'm talking more about this over here today, not this, okay? Because this over here, this whole error thing, this is why I say, go back and read it yourself, just to be sure I didn't do something right, right? Just in case Pastor Tim hasn't grown up fully. And I haven't, you know, I hope 80-year-old Tim's going to be a lot smarter than 40-something-year-old Tim, right? Like, I'm going to have new understanding of the truth that has been true the whole time, right? Um, I'm going to grow. You're going to grow. We're all going to change as we grow deeper in our relationship with God. So I'm talking about this one over here, the, 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 the heresy or the false teachings, the ones that the enemy uses to steal, kill, and destroy people's lives spiritually and shipwreck them in their faith. And, um, and, and, and so that's what I'm talking about. So let's, let's, let's talk about the fruit, okay? Uh, let's talk about the fruit of the two different kinds of teaching. The fruit of true teaching, godly biblical teaching, and the fruit of false teaching, that which is like these guys that Paul is telling Timothy, you got to command them to stop, Okay? I have a long list. If you want to come up and take a picture, you can, because it's a lot there, and it's not in your notes. But this is what, Tim, this is what Paul described to Timothy. Those that bring a false word or a controversy or a myth or a genealogy or, or fill in the blank, they're adding to the gospel, whatever it is, this is what they create in people and in the church. They create envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, constant friction, greed, pride. Uh, they have no peace. They don't bring peace. They create worry, fear, a false hope, and insecurity. That's what a false teacher brings. That's the culture that gets created when somebody's continually preaching something that is false. It's against God's word. It's against the gospel. That's what happens. That's what was happening. That's what Paul said to Timothy, right? If we go back to those verses, he said, he said those words, in, uh, in, in uh, the First Timothy 6 passage, it says says they have an unhealthy interest for controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, constant friction. They're from a corrupt mind. They've been robbed of the truth. So there's, there's some thieving going on. Isn't that the enemy's work? Isn't that what he does? They've been robbed of the truth, and they think godliness is for financial gain. So there's a lot of pride in there, isn't there? That's what they think it is. Now, how many of you want to live a life like this? Show of hands. Right? We don't. We don't want those things because they're not of God. They're, they're, that's Satan's playground. That's the fruit of what happens when we're underneath false teachers uh, in our life. And, and, um, and yet we see something different over here. When we put ourselves under spiritual authority, preaching the biblical word, biblical truth, these are the things that Paul says to Timothy. This is the fruit. This is what I see in you, Timothy. He says, I see, I see a spirit of righteousness, not like self-righteousness, but godly righteousness and godliness, faith, love, endurance, a gentleness, again, love, a pure heart, a clear conscience, sincere faith, joy, a, a, a feeling of peace, having patience and self-control. These are the fruit of the gospel. This is the fruit of right teaching. When you experience somebody who is really bringing the Word of God and you start to live into it, that's what you should experience in your life. Now, I'm not saying your life's always going to be easy, right? I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and I'm not going to say that the Holy Spirit's not going to convict you of some things. That does kind of suck sometimes, doesn't it? Like when all of a sudden it's like, oh, 
I didn't feel that one, and I didn't know it was there. And it kind of hurts. It's like, oh, I got convicted of that one. But the whole idea is that conviction, it prunes out the things so we can experience righteousness, faith, right? Um, Galatians 5, we did a whole series on the fruit of the Spirit this last spring. If you didn't, if you weren't here for that one, it's a great series. It's a really good series. And in Galatians, those, that's the fruit of the Spirit, right? These ones down here, like, like faith, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. All those, that's what the Spirit builds up inside of us, and that's what we start to live out when we are walking with God in His Word, in His truth, by the power of the Spirit. That's what. So I'll just ask it, I guess. Who wants the, these things in their life, right? Yeah, show of hands. Those of you who didn't raise your hands, you don't have hands, I guess, right? Like, these are the things we all want, whether we're a Christian or not. Like, yeah, I want a life of peace. I, w- I would love to be more patient. I, I would love uh, to have a, a pureness in my heart that, like, I have a clear conscience because I'm not intentionally harming anybody or myself or sinning against people. Like, I, that's what we desire. And yet the enemy's coming to kill, steal, and destroy with these false teachings and these individuals that try to bring these false teachings in that start to create this. It, it, this gets created in individual lives, and it gets created inside of churches. Now, I try to be careful, and sometimes I'm not, so we'll see if I'm careful. <laughs> There's, there are more times than most of you would know in the history of our church that wolves have come in to try to look like sheep and have brought with them this. And as a pastor, as spiritual shepherds, Paul is saying to Timothy, it's your job as the shepherd of this flock to command them to not teach. And if they continue to teach, to lead them down a road of, of biblical um, discipline, spiritual discipline. And there's a process in that that we see in Scripture, that if somebody is completely unrepentant and they do not want to change and they continue in this, that we can say, get out of here. <laughs> we can let them know you no longer have a part in this flock. If this is who you're going to be, leave. Because that is protecting the flock, those that want to experience these things, so that they can experience these things and understand better the biblical truth that God has to transform and change your life by the power of the Spirit. So there are so many times that as pastors, we are the ones that get bitten by these wolves. We are the ones that have to have the closed-door conversations. And I'm telling you, having closed-door conversations with people who act like this is always so fun. I just love them, and I sleep great that night, right? Like, it is hard. It's hard. But that's a part of spiritual leadership. We protect the flock from the wolves that want to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. The ones that that want to remove something or add something to the gospel, that have their own agenda to pull as many people as they can towards their opinion, and all it does is it creates conflict, frustration, envy, all these things, right? So I would encourage you, pray for us. <laughs> pray, pray for your shepherds as we do that. And also be a part of protecting the flock. Don't allow people, all of us, don't allow people to create this and to pull us into it. That's the discerning of the spirits. That's discerning between a true teacher of the word and a false teacher. And now let me describe for you what these false teachers look like, okay? So we're going to go to a whole nother level. Everybody ready? Okay. Um, because there's a, there's a difference. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about, like, just pastors. Because, again, pastors and elders, we're people. So we're going to make mistakes. That's just reality. Show us grace as we show you grace. It's a graceful situation, right? Like, we, we can deal with that. I'm talking about those who, who have been... Uh, who have gone so far in their thoughts, their life, and their doctrine, and they have a leadership role that they call spiritual, but it's the wrong spirit. And they're pulling people away from the true gospel into hell itself and, uh, and shipwrecking people's faith in the process. These people have certain traits that you'll see over and over and over again. A number of these people have TV shows, and they're on TV all the time. And they, some of them sound really good. I mean, they do. They sound really good. 
But we've got to look under the surface and see some traits, okay? Because traits of false teachers, one, they will most likely be a man pleaser rather than a pleaser of God. Meaning a false teacher will be one that says this. When they're, maybe they even have a church. Maybe their pastors say, oh, I'm not going to preach on this topic because I know that would offend like these people and these people. They might stop giving, so I don't want to do that. So I'm going to stay away from those topics. I'm going to stay on these ones over here. They're, they're more about pleasing men and protecting their role and position than they are about pleasing God and preaching truth. Does that make sense? They become man pleasers because it feels good to please men because then you get props, right? You, you get applause. You're like, yeah, that was a woo, great message. That one made me feel good. It's the whole tickling of the ears to make you feel good as you leave kind of thing. It's like, that's not biblical teaching. That's self-motivated preaching. They become man pleasers rather than pleasing God first and foremost. A lot of times, these false teachers, they will actually attack godly leadership. They may show up into a church, and then they may start accusing the pastors and the, and the preachers. And they'll be the ones that say, well, you heard what they said. They didn't do that right, and they didn't do it the way I would do it. And they start undermining spiritual leadership, even though they're not putting themselves under it. Typically, if that's them and they're doing that, they are a false teacher. They're seeking something other than biblical truth. Everybody with me on that? They typically reject spiritual authority, meaning uh, a false teacher won't put themselves underneath any other spiritual accountability in their life. This is really dangerous, and I am going to be—I'm not really pulling any punches on this, okay? Because I want you to know that and be protected. So often, and I see this so often, whenever you have a ministry, and the whole ministry, and all the things that they do, their ministry is their name, and then ministries, um, be very careful, right? If it's like Bill Miller Ministries, because it's all about Bill Miller, right? That's the ministry that he does. It's about him— um, and, and usually a lot of times these individuals that create these ministries based around them and their names have no spiritual authority over the ministry that they lead. They are the ultimate authority in that ministry. And everybody underneath them who works in that ministry is an employee. And I don't know about you, but would you ever talk back to your employee when it, they're the one that depends on you having food for your family? No, there's no accountability at that level when you don't put yourself under spiritual accountability in, in relationship. So when you see a man or a woman that has a ministry, typically their name is the ministry, and there's no spiritual covering or authority over them, um, run the other direction. It is most likely a man-made ministry. That is a big trait of a false teacher. They reject spiritual leadership authority, and their ministry 100% is outside of the realm of a local church body. That's another red flag for me. Okay. Okay. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm trying to protect. They typically, false teachers, preach big about small stuff. That's what, he, what Paul was talking about to Timothy. He's like, these guys, they go back to these genealogies, and they find these one words, and they take these one words, and they bring them out, and then they make them a big deal. Well, th- that one thing and that one genealogy said this, and then they live their whole life wrapped around that one idea. And so if anybody disagrees with that, it's like you're— I don't know, you're punching their firstborn child or something, right? It's like, ah, you know, they just get angry and frustrated because they're taking a small thing and making it an enormous thing while they're forgetting about the big thing of the gospel, right? So they're ignoring the main thing, which is the gospel and good theology. They're making it about a small thing, and that's the way they live their life. Most likely, they are a false teacher. They're trying to get you to buy into their thing. They're, They're trying to manipulate others to think that this small thing is what really, really matters. They create controversies. Man, there's some that I've had to wrestle with, this whole flat earth crap, sorry. Um, (laughs) I'm sorry, at New Hope, we believe the earth is round. Should I I rewind that? Tim, Pastor Tim believes that the earth is round because I, I look at the fruit of the controversy of flat earth and I don't see the fruit of the Spirit. I see a controversy wrapped around somebody's opinion that's trying to build a program, and there's a lot of sales of books happening right now, just saying. Do you see what I'm saying? They, make, they take a small thing or a small side note in Scripture, and they make it the thing that they live their life and preach, and they're missing it. They're missing it. They preach big about small things. Um, I'm going long, but you guys love me enough, don't you? Eloquent speech and salesmanship. A lot of times false teachers, they'll make you feel good. And they'll sell you that used car with the flat tires and the hole in the gas tank, right? Like, they will, they're good. And they've got big, white, smiley, white teeth and nice hair. I'm not going to say any names, 
but it rhymes with Moles Stostein. Um, <laughs> they are eloquent salesmen. I said I wasn't going to say any names. I just did. His name's Joel Olstein, by the way. And he is one of the most, he's the mo one of the most um, influential um, people that lead people a degree off of the gospel. If your life is about your life and your best life now, you're missing the gospel. Your life's going to be, you're going to go through, go through some really hard times in life. That's just truth, and I'll explain that in just a minute. There are people that will sell you something, and you're going to go buy their book, and they're going to do just fine by you buying their book. Because they want to win arguments and gain followers, these people. Uh, they continually uh, talk about dreams or visions. This is a dangerous one, okay? People that continually say, I have a new revelation from God. People that say, I had a dream, and, and now all their teachings are wrapped around their new revelations and their dreams, and yet they're not really preaching the simplicity of the gospel. Be very careful. I believe we've given, been given the full revelation of God in his word. He's already given it to us. He's given us the Holy Spirit in us. If somebody continues to try to bring you back by saying, I have a new revelation, I have a new word, I have a new revelation, I have a new word, that is probably their revelation and their word. And uh, because the next thing that they're going to tell you is sow a seed into my ministry. Now, I know some of you have done that, and you've listened to these preachers and these pastors because then what they end up doing is exploiting their followers for personal gain. That is a classic, classic false teacher. Because they'll get you to buy in so much that you're like, oh, I want that. I want that blessing, or I want this, or I want that. And anybody that promises you a blessing that only they can give you when you associate into their ministry is now adding to the gospel work. It's Jesus saved you, but now I have something for you too that you can't get unless you come to me and, and plant your seed or give me my, your money, and then I will release that from the kingdom of heaven to you. That is, a, that is straight from the pit of hell, guys. It is. That those, those preachers and teachers have a special place in hell, honestly. We read that in scripture. There's a special place for them that God says they will have their day God is a God of justice. He forgets nothing. He forgives everything. But those who are apart from him and have demented themselves so far to steal from his work, he will show his justice against those individuals. False preachers are there for their financial gain. It didn't change. Did you read the last part of the verse I read? <laughs> this is what, exactly what Paul said who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means for financial gain. There's nothing new under the sun. It's been happening since the early church. Just now they have brighter white teeth and slicker hair and a big TV, right? Like, um, now this can happen. It's not just TV preachers. This can, this can happen to any preacher. This can happen to any church. It can happen anywhere. What I'm saying is be aware. Our word here from Paul to Timothy to us is be aware that they are out there and it is the enemy's work in the church to steal, kill, and destroy. And we are the ones and, and the spiritual leaders and the church as a whole are going to protect each other and protect our flock from those that want to come in and do that. They have no place here. Now, if they want to humble themselves, if they want to walk into the conviction of the Holy Spirit, if they want to change, welcome. We love you. Let's walk in that together. But I'm hard-pressed to find anybody who lives like this who has ever changed. Now, that's, I'm not trying to be judgmental there, okay? God can do whatever he wants, when he wants, with who he wants. But we need to be careful. So these are the false doctrines that they, they, they preach on. These are some of the prevalent false doctrines, okay? I'm just going for it, man. This is fun. All right. This is fun. I love this. Why? Because we're being set free from lies is why. Prevalent false doctrines is this. Jesus equals my happiness, Right? It's kind of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. It's, if I have Jesus, that means I have everything, and everything's going to be good. And there's a huge hole in that because half this world is in poverty, and they are Christians. Something's wrong, right? If, if Jesus equaled health, wealth, and prosperity, all of the billions of people in poverty who accepted Jesus Christ would now be rich, and those cultures would be wealthy, correct? But that's not true. That's not how it works. Whenever I traveled to the Dominican Republic in 2017, I saw strong, some of the most strongest disciples of Christ that, I, that I've ever seen, and they had nothing, but they had the biggest smiles on their faces. See, uh, Jesus, yeah, brings joy. Yes, absolutely. But wealth and happiness? No. 
Not always. Not for most of us. And, uh, and a lot of times, wealth and happiness destroys the gospel work in our life because we trust it more than God. Preach it. All right, so, so this whole gospel thing doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons. The other reason is, um, if that were the case, everybody who was a, a, a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, it means the only way they would die would be just from old age. It would be natural causes, right? Because if everybody who has Christ is supposed to have health and wealth— it means everybody should die with a lot of resources and everybody should just die of natural causes. But I've known some of the most godly people in my life who died of cancer. How can I equate if this is what Jesus wants, but that's how it went? Then there's something wrong with my Jesus. Do you see what happens to people's faith when they get shipwrecked? When they believe something and somebody, they bought a lie that isn't the truth and then they see it not happen, well, then I'm not having anything to do with this God at all shipwreck. We need to know that we know what we know is the truth. The balloon is red. The donut is real. Right? Jesus doesn't necessarily equal, we may have some happiness in life. It's good. He wants us to be happy. I'm not saying Jesus is a downer. (laughs) But Jesus equals my joy would be a better truth. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said, but don't worry, I have overcome the world. And when he said that, he meant he's with you in this world. He'll be with you in the troubles that you go through. That's sound doctrine and teaching. Um, Okay, legalism is another pretty big false doctrine because the Old Testament still creeped into the New Testament church. The Old Testament, the religion was do good, do good, keep the list, keep the list, you'll make your way to heaven, right? Climb the ladder to God. And that's legalism. What legalism does, it says, we love the gospel that Jesus died for me. All right, now do good as well, and so that you can earn your way there as well, right? It adds to the gospel. Anything that is Jesus and fill in the blank is a false doctrine. It's just Jesus. That's it. That's our only way. There's no other way. There's no addition. There's no subtraction. When it's it's just Jesus is the only way we get to heaven, not Jesus plus, and legalism would say, Jesus plus working and doing and being a pretty person, Right? Or hyper-grace is the opposite of that. So hyper-grace says this, because Jesus saved me, that means I can sin all the more because I'm already forgiven. Party! Right? That's what hyper-grace says. It's like, can I sin all the more because I have grace all the more and I experience it all the more? Isn't that what it's about? Like, hyper-grace is wrong because actually what it shows is you don't actually have Jesus to begin with. Your salvation isn't real. You aren't actually saved because where there is no fruit, there is no salvation. That's just, that's not judgment just I've seen it way too many times. People say, well, I prayed the prayer in third grade. That means I can party and live life now and still get to heaven. And that is a false doctrine. We do good because of Jesus. We don't do good to get to Jesus. All right, is everybody with me? The whole name it and claim it theology, which is, or doctrine, which is, is God is up there and he's, whatever I pray, he has to do because that's what he said. So if I want something in my life, I'm just going to pray and pray. God, give us, give us, give us, give us, give, give me this thing. And, and because I've named it and I claimed it, I'm going to receive it no matter what, right? That is a false teaching. Actually, Jesus teaches us to prayer in alignment with God's will. So when we pray in accordance with God's will, because we know him so well, God's will is done and he moves. He loves moving in his will and he loves moving in our lives and he loves answering prayers. And he invites us in that relationship to continually pray to him. But when we turn it into genie in the lamp, poof, what do you need? Poof, what do you need, right? Aladdin, you know, like, it doesn't work that way. And that's, that's that false teaching. You can't name and claim it. And the last one is salvation is Jesus plus just whatever. If they add something, it's wrong. <laughs> All right. Prevalent false doctrines. There's a lot more out there. Um, but I wanted to, s- to just get a picture of the main ones. So that... You have been given a filter. You have now been given a tool, just as Paul was given to Timothy, to say, who am I putting myself underneath as my spiritual authority? Who am I choosing? Because we will all choose to have some kind of spiritual authority over our lives. If you're part of New Hope, that's, that's, that's me, that's Pastor Jim, that's our elders, that's, our, that's, that's us. And when you see true biblical teaching, true biblical authority, it is always done in community. It is always led with a, with a spirit of humility and mutual accountability because that, that leaves no one person as the person, right? This is not Tim Broughton Ministries. Oh, dear Lord, shoot me now, right? 
This is New Hope Church. This is God's church. It'll be God's church when I'm long gone. It'll still be God's church. At my prayer is that it grows and multiplies, and some of these 12-year-olds in here will be pastoring in this church someday, right? Like, temporary. <laughs> but whoever you put yourself under, you have to filter that through a lens like this. Are they preaching the truth of the gospel? Are they adding or subtracting? Are they preaching a doctrine that doesn't really align with God's word? And then whenever we preach on a weekend, that's why we say go home and read it yourself. Test it. Test and, and see if it's from God or not. And you can test and see where Tim was a little off here. Or you can test and see, and I usually say this is Tim's opinion, so take that for what it's worth, all right? <laughs> um, but when we get into God's word, you put yourself under spiritual authority. Who are you putting over you? Because you're going to be reading spiritual books you're going to be probably listening to some other preachers and pastors on podcasts or on video or on TV. Be very careful who you put in your life because I and we here at New Hope don't want you to shipwreck your faith because of a false teaching. God, I thank you that you have hidden nothing from us. What you wanted revealed, you have revealed it to us in your word and through your spirit's work in our life, revealing it and enlightening it. You are a God who is able to be found. You're not hiding. I pray, God, that you would help each of us as we think about these things today. We wrestle with this. Help us to be so wise about who we follow. Help us to be so discerning so we don't shipwreck our faith. Help us to listen carefully and to get in the scriptures on our own. And God, I'm praying over our church body. I, I'm, I'm, I pray for a protection of your spiritual presence and your angel armies that would fight the fight that we don't see in the spiritual realm. And we would be victorious through your spirit's power and your truth. Thank you for this word. Use it for what you want to, God. Amen. Now, in our challenge time, and I, I 